Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, uh, where we'll discuss uh, credit stress testing um, and trying to give you some ways to be uh, prepared before your regulators might ask you about it. Uh, today, as always, uh, we will be sending out a link to today's recording, as well as a copy of the slides that you will see here. My name is Sean O'Brien, I'm the president of QuickRate. Uh, and I'm pleased to be joined today by both Steve Hunnies and David Ruffin. Uh, Steve, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for joining us today, everybody. My name is Steve Huntington. I'm a director of uh, Quick Analytics. I've been uh, spent my entire career working with community financial institutions on everything from M&A and capital planning and raising to uh, model design and maintenance. And I've been working with Sean here at QuickRate for a little over a decade. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, David, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Sean and Steve. Uh, David Ruffin, principal of IntelliCredit. Um, we formed IntelliCredit in 2019, and uh, yesterday I celebrated my 50th uh, anniversary in the banking industry. 50 years ago yesterday, I took a job in banking. So. <laughs> all right, congratulations, David. That's awesome. Uh, all right, um, just a reminder, as David touched on, IntelliCredit is our newest division. Obviously, many of you are familiar with uh, the non-brokered CD marketplace, and then our credit stress test at the portfolio level uh, resides in Quick Analytics along with our CECL solver and the performance metrics and analysis tools. Um, again, just a reminder, most of you have probably been on one of webinars before. Uh, we if you, will certainly monitor these throughout the presentations, but if you have questions, certainly submit those in the chat or the Q&A feature and we'll either take them uh, in the midst of the conversation or certainly um, at the end of today's presentation. Um, we're just gonna talk about obviously stress testing, some of the confusion that a lot of banks have around it. We'll talk about a couple of, uh, you know, most co more commonly uh, the types of tests uh, and then, uh, pot you know, potentially again, just then what this means for you and your role and options as bankers. Uh, and then obviously the, the Q and A. Um, again, just uh, as we've been doing lately, we're just gonna do a couple of quick polling questions. Uh, certainly appreciate if you uh, would participate, but let me just go ahead and launch these. Uh, the first question is um, just simply, have you completed a stress test in the last 12 months? And the options are yes at the portfolio level, yes at the loan level, yes both at the portfolio and loan level, or just simply no. So we'll just give this uh, 15 to 30 seconds, and then uh, there's just two other questions today. Again, uh, just helpful to get a sense of where everybody is uh, in their stress testing journey. Okay, all right. Go ahead and end this one. Uh, let me share the results. Uh, yes, you can see 44% yes at the portfolio level, then evenly split between yes at both levels, the loan level, and no for 19% of the respondents. So thank you for uh, answering that one. Let me, oops, go to the next question here. As a regulator asked you for a credit stress test in the last 12 months. Uh, so similar answers here. But uh, again, uh, I think one of the things that we certainly want to emphasize today is, you know, being proactive with the credit stress testing is always favorably received by the, by your regulators. So uh, again, uh, you know, we, we anticipate more banks will be asked about this in the next 12 months uh, and certainly think it's worth everybody's uh, time to, to at least at the portfolio, portfolio level, uh, run uh, uh, some type of stress test. So uh, again, let me go ahead and end this one. Um, answers uh, 42, yes, at the portfolio level, 6% yes, at the loan level, Yes, at both, and then 36% said uh, hadn't uh, were no. So uh, again, just share those, and then we'll move on to the final question here. Um, and this one is: Did you use an internal and outside resource for your credit stress test? And so, uh, just uh, two options here: internal or external. Uh, again, no magic. You know, again, I think with stress testing, a lot of it is really getting your arms around data. Um, I think that's one of the, the benefits we think you'll see with the, the, the credit stress test tool within Quick Analytics uh, that we'll show you here uh, shortly. So uh, let me go ahead and just give this another couple of seconds and we'll end this one. 
And as you can see, 61% with an internal resource, 39% with an external resource. So again, thank you all very much for participating in those. Um, you know, again, I think when we talk about stress testing, I think, you know, it conjures up a lot of different things um, to, to, different, uh, to different bankers. But I think one of the things that more recently we certainly encountered is why do I a stress test when there's, no, when there's no stress or I'm not feeling any stress? Um, and I think, you know, again, I think the expectations around stress testing really kind of came whole, you know, out of the financial crisis and particularly Dodd-Frank. Uh, which just brought upon us, uh, you know, just a more, uh, you know, sense of just overall enterprise risk management. And in particular, I think for community banks, this took the form uh, of stress testing. Um, it's certainly never a substitute for quality initial underwriting and, you know, uh, you know, good, diligent, vigilant post-booking loan servicing. Um, but I think the the the, the main goal, the, the starting point for all this is regulators want management and the board to know what the capital cushion is at the bank. Um, going back to the financial crisis or coming out of the financial crisis, uh, the autopsies of the failed banks, there was a clear disconnect between what the level of risk understood to be by the board of directors and what management understood it to be. Uh, in those cases where banks had issues, there seemed to be a pretty vast difference in understanding. And so the idea was through stress testing, and identifying that capital cushion that all constituencies in the bank could be on the would be on the same page uh, about the level of risk in the loan portfolio as well as what that capital cushion uh, looked like. So that's really kind of the genesis uh, and the thought behind you know this stress testing. Um, again, I think um, for many of us, right there there are many different approaches, or we think about different approaches for stress testing. I think the good thing is, is that, you know, you can you can tackle this problem a number of different ways. Uh, I think one of the reasons we like the portfolio level is that we or providers like us are able to aggregate that data and make the process a little bit smoother. Um, but again, the same can be said if you have good loan level data um, as well. And so um, there is a little bit of beauty is in the eye of the beholder of this. But I think uh, as with many things in the regulatory and compliance world, getting out in front of it as opposed to leaving a void and having a regulator suggest what you need to do or should do, you know, you can solve and, you know, prevent uh, work on your part by being proactive and then make them tell you or, you know, dictate to you that you need to do more. If you don't do anything, then you kind of leave it wide open for them to really kind of dictate what type of stress test they want you to do. And that may mean or involve more work on your on your part. Uh, whoops. Um, you know, this is a slide that I actually stole from a presentation David did uh, before. Um, but one of the reasons is, you know, there's a, a lot of confusion is, is, again, there's a lot of different ways to tackle this, right? You know, where the data comes from. Am I looking at a loan level or a portfolio level? Should I do it myself? Um, you know, are we held to the same standards that the DFAS banks are? And so, again, this is, there's a lot of uh, you know, contributions to confusion for banks. And so again, I think today we just want to kind of lay out a couple of, you know, clear paths that you might be willing to pursue. Um, again, you know, furthering to the, you know, some of the confusion is whether you should do something again, portfolio top down, loan level bottom up, you know, should it be a scenario analysis? Should it be a sensitivity analysis? The bottom line is again, all of these in some form or fashion can be acceptable um, they all will probably uh, will likely add value. So it's really begin beginning comfortable with a process for you. Where should I start? And then just recognize that this is and should be almost an ongoing uh, process. So you don't have to tackle it all uh, right out of the gate. Um, I will say from my point of view, I think for banks, everything really starts with the data. In our example that Steve's going to show you here in a minute at the portfolio level, you know, I think one of the things we say, or I say a lot about quick analytics is, you know, we're, our time is better spent aggregating data so you can analyze it. This is true with the credit stress test. Um, we've aggregated all that call report information to make this process, we think, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, but I think as you move forward and maybe potentially want to do something at the loan level, um, then it really starts to begin and, you know, become a, a question around your data and the availability of it. 
We are big believers in starting with the ILDR file. That's something that IntelliCredit talks a lot about with. Uh, some of you may know that as the flat file or the loan tape or a trial balance, but it captures a lot of the initial information that an examiner might ask, but it also gives you a good building block uh, for loan level data. Um, and then there's an, obviously additional fields that you can you can add to, but I think it's important regardless of what pro approach you're going to take. You know everything really starts uh, with data. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn. Uh, well, I'll move a couple more slides, and then Steve will will take us through a live demo of our tool. Uh, but Steve, I think you can jump in here and start talking yeah. about the three tests that the regulators you know uh, serve as the foundation for our credit stress test. Sure. So in in uh, in our credit portfolio level credit stress test, we perform three completely separate and independent tests. First test is what we call the peer group loss experience. This is where we're aggregating, we're looking at your peers' historical experience, looking at um, loss trends at the segment level, right, with all the, as much granularity as we can get from the call reports um, going back in time. And we're applying your peers' historical experience to your loan portfolio going forward. So we're trying to answer the basic question, if your portfolio, the way it, with its size and its structure, if it were to perform going forward over the next couple of years, like your peers' portfolio performed in different historical contexts, in a healthy environment, in an unhealthy environment, and in a worst case scenario, Armageddon type environment, what would be the pro forma impact on your P&L and your capital? So we are completely reprojecting your income statement and your capital levels going forward two years under varying degrees of stress as defined by your peers' historical experience. Now, the second test, uh, same steps, same methodology, same concept. But instead of using your peers' historical experience as our guide, we use your experience, ignoring how anyone else in your marketplace might have performed. If you were to perform, so we're kind of asking a, a similar question, right? If you were to form going forward like you did in the past, what would be the pro forma impact? So we look at, you know, how bad did it really get in your portfolio during the last credit crunch? When did it go bad? Where did it go bad? And how bad did it go? And if you had to experience that again, moving forward on your current uh, loan portfolio, what would it look like um, from a projection standpoint? And so test one and test two are designed to be completely symmetrical to each other. So you can compare apples to apples, what the future might look like if you were to perform like some of your peers did in the past or, or like you did in the past. The third test is a bit of a different animal. It's what they call the uh, reverse stress test. Uh, it's what I fondly refer to as the, how much rope do we have to hang ourselves with test. Uh, they call it a reverse stress test because it, it, it sort of takes the methodology from the first two tests and run it backwards. Instead of reprojecting losses and using that to reproject earnings, and then finally using that to reproject capital, we start at a certain capital level, say the minimum to be well capitalized. And we work sort of backwards through those steps to figure out what levels of losses could we endure or absorb in the bank moving forward before our capital were to drop below certain critical, let's say, PCA thresholds. So it really gives you an idea of exactly, you know, how you are set up from a capital and an earn and a strength of your earnings uh, and revenue standpoint to absorb those losses before before you start having more problems with your uh, with your examiners and, and auditors. Uh, Sean, next line. So the first, I guess, we sort of already kind of already stepped through this. In each of those tests, we're we're running three steps, right? The first step is estimating, or sorry. Um, Estimating loan losses, depending upon how history has, has looked at your peers or you. Second step is using those reprojected loan losses to reproject earnings, and then finally to reproject capital. Um, at this point, I think uh, probably go ahead and share my screen, Sean, and we can well, actually, we can do that one for just a second. If we, uh, if you can get back to it, sorry. Jump again. Yeah, so this is just a, a screenshot of when you first pull up our credit stress test. Um, just to remind you, the entire the entire report is actually run before you log in. So when you first log in, it's already going to give you results right out of the box. 
Now that'll be with a bunch of default assumptions that I'm gonna go through. They're very clearly labeled what assumptions we've made. And then you can go through and you can modify the ones that you think um, should be tweaked or whatnot. But we wanted to give you an, a starting point of an actual full run credit stress test. The beauty in that is that you can go into your inputs and change any individual input you want and immediately see the results of what, what impact that change in input would have on the output. Um, so it, it makes the whole iterative process of, hey, what happens if our losses are this much worse? What happens if we raise two or $3 million you know, next year? What happens if we complete a merger and we have a different portfolio? You can change individual inputs and see in real time immediately, hey, that change in input had a significant impact on our, on our stress test or on our future capital in these scenarios, or it was relatively benign. It made very little difference. So that kind of speeds up your process of finding out what you're really sensitive to and, and, and versus, uh, versus not. So let's go ahead without any further ado and I'll share my screen. You see it. Excellent. So when I first go to quick analytics and click on the credit stress test, this is the first thing you're going to see. So it's already going to be, again, set up to sort of give you some results right out of the box. Um, before we go through these, the test results, let's walk through the inputs so you can understand what you're going to want to plug into the tool and what, uh, what that means from an output standpoint. So I'll click on customize inputs. There's a couple different areas of inputs, some financial inputs, and then some peer and some historical sort of a look back period inputs, so to speak. Um, first thing, because this is a projection model, we're going to have to, we're going to be making some assumptions about your uh, future, future income statement. Now, anything credit related like loan loss provisions, Oreo losses, those things, we're going to be projecting as part of the calculations. But we need to get some idea from you guys on the front end, hey, you know, over the last 12 months, you guys have had $139 million in net interest income. Do you expect sort of at a baseline um, projection to continue? So you can see our assumptions kind of take your last 12 months and keep that run rate the same, um, whether it's fee income, um, overhead expense, but you can, you can certainly plug in some growth into the tool here and, and project increases in net interest income and fee income and overhead expense. So we ask you to go ahead and plug in some values there. If you want to leave the values that are def by, by default, those will actually work quite well in probably 90% of cases. Um, once you have modified any financial projection inputs, then we go to customizing the loan portfolio. Since it's a credit stress test, right? We, we really do want to look at the portfolio and consider where we may see losses from. If you have certain parts of your portfolio that have significant government guarantees, if you have a, a sizable SBA portfolio that has a government guaranteed balance, we're gonna wanna back the guaranteed balances, the ones that have no risk of credit loss out of the portfolio so that we're not applying potential you know, future loss rates to balances that have no real loss liability. So here's where obviously this was more active when uh, lots of people had um, uh, large um, CNI portfolios that were PPP loans. Those are mostly washed out of the system at this point but there's still a place for them or any other government guarantees that you want to back out, you can back out here to customize the portfolio a bit. And we're going to come back to these other assumptions in a few minutes, but the tool does also allow you to plug in capital raises as part of the, uh, of the process as well. Once you sort of run an initial stress test and you see where your future capital, uh, what it looks like, depending upon how punitive you're being in the test, you might want to plug in some additional capital one or two years out just to see what kind of impact it would have. That's kind of the, the whole point of this type of stress testing is when you're done with it, what do you do with it, right? It becomes part of your capital planning process. So the ability to, to interject, to inject some additional capital after you've run a couple scenarios to see what impact it would have in alleviating any, any shortfalls you might have is, uh, is, is part of the iterative process that this tool allows. After you've plugged in financial inputs, we're gonna make a couple assumptions about peers. Remember the first test, we're using our peers' historical losses as our guide for what future losses we might have. So we have to decide, well, what peer group are we gonna use? 
You can use a standard UVPR peer group, which is what I'm using for, for today. You can use a what we call a state QCBI peer group. That's simply just all the community banks in your state. So I clicked on that. And instead of, um, this is a large community bank up in Maine that we use a lot of times as a guinea pig. They're in UVPR peer group three, which has a few hundred institutions. As soon as I click on this, now we're just looking at community banks in the state of Maine because they happen to be in Maine. If you want, you can certainly completely customize the peer group, which is something I would actually su highly suggest doing. Um, if you think about it in stress testing, uh, there's going to be a very important geographic element to it. If you're using a national UVPR peer group, while your examiners may be extremely familiar with that peer group because they're the ones that came up with the ideas, it's not going to be very geographically specific. Uh, for example, if you're a community bank in Maine, you really don't care how bad credit card lending got in Southern California in 2008, just because they happen to be a similar size, right? You care what types of loans went bad in your neck of the woods and when that stress really happened in your, in your local geography. So building a good custom peer group of similar size community banks in your state or in, let's say, a five county region around, around where you're located is, is typically a best practice for this type of stress test. The nice thing about this is you're not limited by, by any of that, right? We don't charge by the test output or anything else. So if you run a custom stress test or a custom peer group, and you're worried that your examiner might think you're trying to sort of manipulate and massage the data by picking a, a, an overly attractive peer group, you can run it again with a, with a UVPR peer group and put that side by side with your custom peer group. So there is no uh, whiff of impropriety. Um, so again, you can, and it only takes a couple seconds to, to swap the peer group out and then see what the difference in results is. Um, after you've chosen a peer group, you're going to choose a look back period. What that means is for a baseline scenario, we want to see, you know, what kind of losses did your peers have during a recent healthy environment? Well, that's pretty, pretty easy, right? Median net charge off ratios for most loan categories these days hover right around zero, and they have been for a while now. Um, credit card loans, even in a healthy environment um, from, a, from a loss perspective, um, typically are the highest. So you can see here credit card um, uh, cons consumer loans here have higher than zero loss rates. But in a baseline scenario, you're just we're just not seeing very many losses at the median level right now. However, in an adverse scenario, um, we look back to the, the kind of the meat of a last downturn. And after surveying and looking at community banks, loss rates, um, Oreo losses, reserve levels, and charge off levels throughout the country, kind of the, the meat of a last downturn was 2009, 10, and 11. Um, those three years, pretty much across the, the board, were the worst three statistically, not only for charge offs, but also for losses on Oreo and also for highest reserve levels during the last credit crunch. Um, so we start by, uh, by default choosing the years 2009, 10, 11. But of course, depending upon your peer group, you might find that those weren't the three worst years during the last credit, credit cycle. So you can come here and say, let's say you wanted to add 2012 and 2013. You can just click on the slider, drag it to the left or right, and include or exclude different years. If I'm looking at Let's say, let me roll back to the national UVPR peer group so we get some more uh, recognizable numbers here. Um, if I look at uh, UVPR peer group three and I just look at the total net charge off ratio, uh, you can see the, the, the levels were the worst in 2009 and 2010. And they were still pretty bad in 2011. And then they started significantly improving um, starting in uh, 2012, 2013. So if I wanted to choose a three-year group, I would say, yeah, 2009 through 2011 still looks pretty good. Well, pretty bad, pretty good, if you know what I mean. And uh, so that's where uh, we'll stick there. You also have the ability to decide how punitive you want your adverse and severely adverse scenarios to become. By default, we use 75th percentile loss rates for the adverse scenario and 90th percentile loss rates for the severely adverse scenario. Um, Question, first question I get a lot is, well, we're already using the worst three years in, in recorded history as far as losses are concerned. Why are we not just using median values? Why are we making it even more punitive than, than median values? And the answer is, that's just because that's the way that uh, a lot of the regulators design their, like the DFAS tests and some of the tests designed for larger institutions 
wanted to see if your capital could withstand it if you were to perform not as bad as the average, your average peer during the last credit cycle, but if you performed worse than the majority of your peers did, could your capital withstand that if that were to happen again for an extended period of time? So we default to 75th and 90th percentile. You can make the whole test more punitive by bumping these percentiles up or less punitive by bumping them down. And that would be dependent upon your peer group, right? If you're looking at Southern California or Florida as your peer group, 75th percentile in 2009, 10, 11 is probably going to be as punitive as you really feel like you need to be. But if you're looking at a group of Midwestern banks that didn't really participate as much during the last credit cycle, you may very well want to try to make the scenarios even more punitive than what we have by default. If I change this to the 80th percentile, for example, it takes a couple of seconds. Every single value here now recalculated to be the 80th percentile loss rate or what loss rate was higher than or worse than 80% of the banks in the peer group. If I wanted to customize by segment, if I said, listen, I want to stress my CRE portfolio more than the rest of my uh, consumer loans, for example, you could come in and just bump up a segment or two to a higher percentile loss rate to make that part of the portfolio uh, more punitive in an adverse scenario. Once we have an adverse scenario, I'm just gonna go back to 75th percentile. Um, the last thing to do is click on the severely adverse. Severely adverse is designed to be a worst case scenario. That's why we color coded it blood red and everything. It's actually almost worse than a worst case scenario in a lot of situations, because this is assuming that you're gonna perform worse than 90% of the banks in your peer group did during the worst three year period we have on record in every single category of your portfolio simultaneously. So it really is designed to crush the bank from a loss perspective as much as is possible while still using completely 100% real data and real experiences of your peers. Once we have all of those scenarios set up, uh, which again, you don't have to do much tweaking if you don't want to, out of the box, it's pretty, pretty accurate. The last thing to do is to consider look back periods for your bank. Um, do you wanna use the same healthy environment or stress environment? Um, look back period for your bank as we did for the peer group. And that depends on, well, when were your worst years loss wise? Did they match up with the peer group or did you see losses earlier or later in the cycle than your peers? So you wanna kind of find the worst years, so to speak, that you can find for your institution using the same sliders here by just choosing those worst years. Everything recalculates on the fly, right? As soon as you change any one of these inputs, you can toggle right back to the test results and see how, how much of a, of a difference it made. Now, those are all the inputs into the tool. So I'm going to go back to the test results here, and we're going to walk through those three steps of what we're doing with all this historical data to see what it's going to tell us. When I click on the test results, here's the summary. This is kind of a, a single screen, shows us all the most important information from the test on one piece of paper. But if I want to dig into the steps, I'll click on the detail. Remember, there was three steps. First step. We take all that historical loss data from our peers, from our institution, and we use it to reproject, hey, if we have the same loss rates as history, but we apply those loss rates to our current portfolio over the next couple of years moving forward, what kind of losses might we see? So here we are. This is our current loan portfolio as of September 30th of this year. Here are the annual loss rates that we calculated from the inputs, right? These are our peers' loss rates during a healthy environment, remember? pretty close to zero across the board, except for consumer loans during a healthy environment. In an adverse environment, uh, if we had annual loss rates on our current portfolio that matched what we saw, at, our peers saw in 2009, 10, 11 at the 75th percentile, then we'd have significantly higher net charge-offs to contend with over the next couple of years. We would also not only see charge-offs, we would see some loss on the sale of Oreo, which these days is not very big of a deal, but was a very big deal if you remember back to what was happening to, uh, to valuations of, of, uh, of properties that were being um, brought on board on the, on the balance sheet by the bank as, as other real estate owned. Uh, when they were sold off the books, the valuations were, we, they couldn't keep up with valuations and we were seeing lots of loss on the sale of that Oreo. That also impacts capital. And so we take it into account in our, in our tool. And finally, the double whammy of, uh, of an of a, uh, economic, um, credit cycle is not only are you providing on your income statement for the actual net charge-offs that you're seeing ramp up, right? So that your reserve doesn't drop. 
At the same time, you got your regulators there telling you, you need to increase your reserve. You need to have a higher reserve than you had before. So your provision gets the double hit of having to contend with losses and then also having to contend with a higher reserve requirement moving forward than you had in the past. So we take all those things into account um, using the historical data to reproject actual net charge offs and OREO losses and reserve levels that the bank would need moving forward. Once we've reprojected uh, those things, we can plug them into back into an income statement, right? A, a projected income statement. So we project two years going forward. We have net interest income, fee income, overhead expense. These things are relatively consistent. The, the net interest income declines a little bit as the scenarios get more punitive because you have more earning assets that are becoming non-earning. Um, but obviously the big change in projecting income or earnings in different credit environments is that huge uh, increase in loan loss provisions as, uh, as charge-offs begin to ramp up and as the reserve requirement begins to increase. So when you think about projecting loan loss provision, it's really those two components, right? How much do I need to provide for the losses I'm seeing so my reserve doesn't drop? And then B, how much on top of that do I need to provide on the income statement to get my reserve up to a higher level that's going to be expected? Once we do those two things, we have a total provision expense, we layer in any lo expected losses on the sale of Oreo based upon your peers' experience uh, recurring. And then we have a new pre-tax income. We tax it at your effective tax rate or you get a tax benefit if you're losing money. And then we have a reprojected earnings in two years worth of reprojected earnings in all three scenarios side by side. And then the last piece of the puzzle, we apply all that to the capital, right? So we take your current capital levels and ratios we uh, apply the expected earnings or losses, net earnings or losses. Also take into account dividends, assuming dividends get suspended if we're losing money left over, uh, hand over fist. And then any other fun little Basel, um, you know, our schedule RCR adjustments to capital are all taken into account here. And then we reproject your capital levels and ratios going two years out into the future. So that's the entire process. If I go back to the summary here, we'll see all of what I just discussed sort of on one piece of paper, right? We have our losses ramping up as scenarios get more punitive. As a result, our net earnings are dropping. Uh, we still have positive earnings in a baseline scenario, slightly negative earnings in an adverse, and then really negative earnings in a, in a severely adverse scenario. Um, the idea of these tests is not to be earning, you know, 1% ROA, even in a severely adverse scenario. That's not gonna happen if you use any reasonable peer group and you use good look back periods. The idea here is to survive, right? That's why it's a worst case scenario. Then we just take those values and we, and we just you know, make them a little bit more visual so you can see your leverage ratio, your CET1, total tier one and total risk-based ratios sort of declining as the scenarios get more, more punitive. Um, as I said, any changes to the inputs, if I were to make the loss rates a higher percentile rank, you'll see these things drop. If you have, if your inputs, as far as like expected net interest income and fee income, if you expect them to increase significantly over the next couple of years, you're gonna wanna put those into the inputs as well because those are your first line of defense, right? Against losses is, your, is, is the strength of your revenue stream. Um, so that's the first test. Second test, uh, we're not gonna go through step-by-step. Step. It's all the same steps, right? All the same math. The only difference is we're, we're looking at, we're using your historical loss rates as our guide for what kind of losses we might see going forward. So instead of peer-based annual loss rates, these are your actual loss rates, the, the worst loss rate you've ever had in junior liens for two years in a row going forward, right? And et cetera, and et cetera. So you can see how these get more punitive, but based upon your data. And then again, we reproject earnings and reproject capital as a result. And then you can go back to the summary. This particular institution up in Maine, they never saw very much losses. And they have very strong capital. They have a very good, strong earnings revenue stream to absorb losses as they start to uh, escalate. And they've never really seen significant losses even during the last credit cycle. So even in a worst case scenario, based upon their actual experience, they're really not losing any money. That's why you really need test one and test two. If you were to go to your examiner, they say, hey, we need you to do a credit stress test. Um, and you go back and you take the worst losses you've ever seen and you double them. And you do that for two years going forward. 
depending upon your experience or your marketplace, you might still be showing them significantly positive net income moving forward and no impact on capital whatsoever. As truthful and honest as that might be to your historical experience, that's usually just not gonna get the job done from an examiner that wants to see you stress your portfolio in one way, one way or another, right? That's why using test one, the peer group loss experience, where you can see, even if we performed really well in the past, if we were to perform much worse, like our peers did, this is what it might look like. And that's kind of why um, the peer group loss experience is the first one that we that we show. It's typically the one that we see more weight um, put on by, by examiners. And then finally, the reverse stress test. This is where, again, we're starting at a certain capital level ratio in the future and saying, how bad would it have to get for us to get down to this level? So for the minimum to be well capitalized, the fun in this tool uh, is it's iterative, right? To be well capitalized, you have to have a 5% le tier one, uh, CET one, sorry, 5% leverage, 6.5% CET one, 8% tier one, uh, um, tier one and 10% total risk-based capital ratio. You have to have all four of those simultaneously to be considered well capitalized. So if you're gonna start losing money, tons of money, hand over fist, which of those is your bottleneck, right? Which capital ratio are you gonna drop below first? And so that's the first thing we focus on is iterating the tool till we find out which of your ratios is your bottleneck. And then we work backwards to say, what levels of losses would we have to see? Pre-tax losses, you know, backing out revenue streams that are going to continue to recur even in a bad environment and calculate what levels of net charge-offs and Oreo losses you would have to endure over the next couple of years to drop your capital to no longer well capitalized or adequately capitalized. So that's the way the reverse stress test works. Um, we also have an internal uh, target that you can play with. If you remember from the inputs, I said I was gonna come back to this other assumption. Here in the other assumptions, you can plug in any single individual capital ratio you want. Let's say like a 6% leverage ratio or a 9% tier one ratio. And the reverse stress test will calculate what levels of losses you would need to see over the next couple of years to drop your capital to exactly that specific point. So let's say we were, you know, we're an S corp and, and we wanna make sure we've got plenty of capital conservation buffer. We wanna make sure that total risk-based capital ratio never gets below 10 and a half percent. Or even let's say we have an internal target, right? If our total capital gets below 12%, it triggers something at the board. Um, so we want to keep an eye on that 12% level. If I type in 12% here and go back to my reverse stress test, I can see right here, there's a 12% total risk-based ratio. In order to drop to that 12% from where we are today, we need to see losses, pre-tax losses of 83 million, um, or sorry, post-tax losses of 83 million, pre-tax would be more. And we'd actually need to see charge-offs of like 6% of our portfolio would need to go south and be charged off before our total risk-based ratio got below 12%. So that's the kind of the, uh, the way the reverse stress test works. It's a very handy tool. Some of the numbers might seem ridiculously high uh, as, as they should, right? If you see very high, almost unreasonable charge-offs on the reverse stress test, that speaks to the fact that you have a very strong capital base and you have strong revenue streams to absorb losses as they start to escalate. Um, that's pretty much how the tool works from top to bottom. Once you've plugged in all your inputs, you can, everything is done in this interactive environment here. So you can, you can save the scenario, give it a name, give it a date. And then anytime you come back and log back in, you can see any of the scenarios that you've saved. So you can save as many scenarios as you want. They're saved right here securely on our servers. Um, you can share them amongst different people at the institution with different logins if you'd like to. We have, uh, you can export the results. Obviously, once you're done with this, the interactive environment is great for going back and forth and creating scenarios and iterating it. But when you wanna share it externally, um, you can either choose an executive summary if you don't want all the nitty gritty, or if you really do want all the nitty gritty, you can get the full report and you can export it to a PDF or you can export the entire thing into an Excel environment. Um, we have a handy dandy user guide here, which kind of takes you through all the steps that I've just, just gone through here, all the inputs, what to be thinking about as you're plugging in inputs, um, best practices for what to leave alone and what you really need to consider customizing and then what all the outputs mean and then how to start working the results of it um, into a capital planning process. 
that's all part of the user guide. We also have a short little methodology page. Um, and that's pretty much the whole kit and caboodle as of today. Sean, anything that I missed? Uh, no, that's great, Steve. Um, we just had a question come in. We currently subscribe sure. uh, to Cecil. Is this an additional cost? No, this is all part of your quick analytics uh, subscription. So if so I head back to our login page right here, um, if you if you subscribe to Q to Quick Analytics and you have our Cecil tool, right below it is the interactive stress test. So everything I just did, you can do on your bank five minutes from now if you're a Cecil subscriber, and it'll already be preloaded with all your financials, all your history, all those um, um, assumptions. So really, the only things I would consider doing: go in there, create a custom peer group look at the loss rates, maybe tweak some of the financial inputs. And in 10 minutes, you've got something that's really actionable almost out of the box. Great, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, so uh, in your slide deck, we're not gonna go through these, but we just you know, kind of broke down you know, what Steve was talking about. Again, just you know, pointing out uh, some of the highlights for the fields that you would uh, enter as you work through the tool. Again, many of these are covered um, in the uh, user guide that Steve referenced that's available uh, on the interactive uh, credit yep. stress test page. Um, so at this point, I think, you know, uh, as we touched on, right, there's uh, a couple of different ways that banks kind of go at stress testing. Um, the next way is to really kind of go at it from the loan level. Um, and so and at this point, we're going to turn the presentation over to David, and he's going to take us through, uh, you know, conversations and, and what goes behind uh, and how you might uh, address a loan level stress test. David, I'll hand you the screen. Great. Um, hopefully you can. Uh, yeah, I'll let you know when we see it. Share a screen and I'll share. So uh, do you see the screen? Sorry. Uh, we got your screen out the deck yet, though. There we go. There we That's go. There. Sorry about that. OK, so uh, obviously, uh, uh, thank you very much, Steve, for running through that. I just wanted to begin again and reiterate that we started in Telecredit in 2019. Obviously, you have to establish priorities at that point. And our, our primary priority, frankly, was to create a best-in-class loan review application uh, as well as a portfolio diagnostic tool. We call it Smart Loan Review and uh, Portfolio Analyzer. We've been very successful uh, meeting those strategic goals. We're already in 30 plus states uh, doing loan review. Uh, our clients range from $19 billion to $72 million coast to coast uh, in assets. And uh, we obviously had to, through the priority, just uh, push stress testing a little bit to the, the third tier. But I will say that uh, you know what we are certainly all about is creating a robust loan level stress testing uh, component, and we're we're about halfway there. So I'll be you know uh, telecredit, not on un not unlike everything with quick rate and quick analytics, the entire great family we're a part of is is a work in progress, and we're constantly improving and and adding to uh, our functionality. But obviously what we, we need to uh, realize is that with particularly loan level stress testing, uh, the primary thing is to get more granular to represent you know, your idiosyncratic DNA profile. Remember everything that Steve worked, walked through largely was public data, call report data, and uh, the unique division between IntelliCredit and Quick Analytics is uh, their energy sources, public data, our energy sources, the non-public idiosyncratic loan data that resides in each bank, uh, which is really, uh, in, we talk about this quite often, many times community banks and smaller regional banks don't do as good enough job uh, data mining their own. Uh, it, it's, it's loaded with all sorts of uh, unique uh, aspects of, of, of credit performance, particularly now that we appear to be heading for some heightened stress. Uh, that certainly is an area that I think uh, complements well a focus on loan level stress testing. Uh, again, it requires you to have insight in your non-public data. The challenges of that, however, are in these two categories. 
the accuracy of that data and the currentness of that data. I remember probably a decade ago or more when the entire uh, concept of stress testing uh, was being discussed. Uh, and it sounded so incredibly great, uh, that being loan level, but it, implicit in that was that you were effectively re-underwriting your portfolio on a real-time basis or perhaps as, more, as often as quarterly, which is totally impractical. So the issue is the kind of data that you're providing in your loan or mining in your loan port, uh, tape uh, could or could not be very accurate or could or could not be very current. There's also an aspect that we are faced with in the loan level area is that statistical efficacy is very, very important uh, in trying to extrapolate trends in that. Now, I mentioned that strategically where we are and where we aren't, where we aren't quite yet, but certainly coming in the spring of 24 that we'd love to show you in far more robustness. And frankly, our challenge, Steve, is to get to your level uh, at, at Quick Analytics in terms of the robustness of your tool. We're not quite there yet, but we certainly will be providing an automated, enhanced um, by, uh, service. In other words, IntelliCredit personnel can perform it for you or, or do your own, uh, similar to what um, uh, Steve just showed. I will share before I get to the third uh, aspect of this, which we already have and is, is gaining a lot of uh, popularity, um, is that one of the things that we're uh, embarking on is, as you heard Steve many, many times refer to the fact of the, the dearth of net charge-offs in our industry for arguably a decade now, we're going, we're focusing on uh, adding dimension to loan level stress testing that includes perhaps even more of a focus on gross losses as opposed to net losses and why that's important. Uh, you've got some anomalies that have developed in particularly in the Southeast region of the country with uh, banks who had so much uh, bloodletting during the financial crisis of losses that, that some of their so-called loss profile has been skewed by the net recoveries that have occurred in the last few years. Uh, we're going to look at things like uh, accrual status, and we're going to look at things like risk-grade migration profiles and, and the distribution of risk grades within a particular bank as, a, as an indicator of potentially greater stress. But those are some of just the, the areas that we're focused on uh, that are being part of our uh, tools that will be uh, uh, um, made available uh, in the early half of next year. But what we do have uh, is clearly a very robust and, and proven and, and being received very well, what we call loan level stress testing companion with loan review. Uh, and, and basically what that is, is we've embraced the idea that loan review is arguably the most real time perspective of a borrower's current circumstance. Uh, it really does kind of counter the focus on original underwriting or or whenever a uh, an annual uh, servicing memo or annual loan review uh, exercise was undertaken, the loan reviewer, a competent loan reviewer, is charged with understanding the current risk of that portfolio, calculating uh, things like current loan to values, calculating current debt service coverages. And so what we have done is companioned with our loan review and a number of our clients uh, is we uh, perform a stress test uh, often on a variety of, given the obvious focus on CRE concentrations in the community and regional bank space these days, much of it is focused on CRE, but it could be CNI, it could be any other type of uh, subset of your portfolios. But basically we take uh, data that is calculated by the reviewer, uh, put a stress component on that, and then it, it is extrapolated basically uh, to your uh, uh, potential uh, capital risk. Obviously, the sky's the limit almost with the kind of data that you might be able to apply to this. Uh, but in many cases, as Sean alluded to earlier, our energy source is largely that ILDR file or the loan tape. Most banks, I would say, have at most only LTVs or debt service coverages embedded in those loan tapes. And some of these other data points shown in this chart uh, may be, uh, be tracked on some other form of Excel spreadsheet or what have you. But by far the most common that we see in banks 
are the LTVs uh, and debt service coverage ratios. So basically what we're able to do is look at concentrations, whether they be FFEIC codes or other uh, loan types. Uh, again, look at your average risk-based capital or, or community bank leverage ratio, uh, risk rate migrations, as I ind uh, indicated, industries, uh, again, certainly CRE. Uh, but the deliverables, uh, basically what we're going to, we do deliver in this is again, and we pattern this somewhat after the FDIC's white paper of a number of years ago in what they suggested to be uh, quite adequate for a non-complex bank uh, is that we, we again, take the kind of the X, Y axis of, we're just in this case, using two factors, debt service coverage and LTVs. And then um, again, apply a stress to them. In this particular case, it would be a 20% stress. Uh, some would argue, well, how do you do cap rates or how do you do uh, interest rate shocks in, in that? Well, think about it. In some ways, cap rate is a, is a, has impact on LTVs and certainly interest, higher rate increases certainly has an in, uh, impact on debt service coverages. So in theory, you've got some inclusiveness of these other uh, issues in just these two particular um, variables that we do. But again, the, the bottom line is that what we then do is extrapolate the impact on, on the loan type that's specifically allocated to risk-based capital. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, in fact have worked with Steve to, to make sure the accuracy of the way we use the denominator, which is that particular uh, amount of risk-based capital that is allocated to that particular subset or that silo of loans. And then um, the numerator then becomes the, the, the stress portion that goes uh, into our category of stress. And most importantly, what we do, and this we've gotten some really kudos for this, is that we provide a list of the borrowers that are in effect moving the needle the most in terms of if there is degradation in loan to value or debt service coverage. So again, uh, what we don't uh, do is predict any kind of loss. Uh, we just try to uh, 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 identify what would be a potential impact on risk-based capital. I know Sean and I talk about all this, uh, these things all the time. It's, it's not a, 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 an exercise in exactitude. It's really directional uh, accuracy that what is what you're trying to get to here. But again, we've got a lot of robust and 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 tool oriented stress tests that are are coming. Um, but in this particular case, this is clearly being used as we speak, and it seems to be, uh, I think, a very popular uh, companion to loan review. And again, I, it's killing two birds with one stone. It has the ability to use uh, again competent reviewers to be looking at and in effect. Uh, re-underwriting and at you know that's what loan reviewers do in effect is uh, retest and validate uh, where the credit risk is on a given borrower or given relationship and that can be done concurrent to the loan review process. I'll reiter reiterate again we think that a loan review and in the con uh, contours of the loan review is the best time it is really the the best real-time perspective of a borrower's current uh, risk circumstance. Uh, and again, uh, I think it could also be because the way we do our loan review, we do it through often the lens uh, or always through the lens of the bank's policy uh, and their underwriting uh, procedures and such in such a way that it can also complement whatever sensitivity analyses or projections were used at underwriting and versus where, you know, the, the performance of the customer may be at this point. Um, and in, in addition to that, I think what has proven very popular is that we provide the stress test report along with the loan review report. And again, we've gotten some real compliments that that has given uh, bank boards and management a good uh, ability to show that best faith has been made. The irony is that, um, and Sean alluded to this a moment ago, uh, the communities and regional banks are really not mandated precisely to do stress testing. But again, anecdotally, we're hearing uh, situation after situation of exam after exam where regulators have urged uh, even the smallest banks to make sure that they do some form of 
of robust stress testing. And I would hasten to say, and I think the poll numbers would indicate, uh, the, the portfolio level stress tests are probably adequate for the most part, but I think it's very commonsensical that if and when we get into more credit stress, that there will be more pressure on loan level stress testing uh, at that point. So again, uh, Sean, I will uh, hand it over to you um, at this yeah. point. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, and I think, you know, to David's point, I think one of the things that I think we're certainly mindful, and again, I'm going to move through my slides since we passed the deck here. Um, you know, I think, you know, right now, even, you know, an added variable is, um, you know, for many banks who are experiencing issues with their underwater, uh, you know, securities portfolio, you know, I think for them, you know, running some stress tests makes a whole lot more sense. We've seen a lot of those banks, you know, try to, you know, because it does, you know, um, handcuff you in many ways. And I think one of the things that I think you certainly wouldn't want to get caught with is having a severely uh, underwater securities portfolio and then start to experience, you know, some stress in your credit portfolio. I think that's something I would probably want to be ahead of uh, as, as we move into next year. And so again, I think, you know, what do we do? You know, again, as David mentioned, you know, we we're big believers in starting with the portfolio test. Um, certainly, as David mentioned, stress testing is a companion to your loan re loan review makes a tremendous amount of, uh, of sense right here at this point. Uh, and then I think, you know, again, thinking about this as a process, you know, I think really start to, um, you know, tackle and identify what type of data you are currently collecting um, and warehousing, because, you know, moving forward, um, you know, that the quality of your data is going to, you know, impact certainly, but it's also going to improve you know, the, the, your ability or an external party such as ours ability to do loan level stress testing. So, you know, I think really, you know, again, we, we start with the ILDR file, but I think you want to begin, you know, just kind of self-assessing where you are with your data and how readily available uh, that is. And then again, if you need to move on to loan level, you can. Um, I believe any stress test is a good stress test, right? I think it is a process. You got to start somewhere. Um, and so, again, we think the portfolio is the perfect place to start. But uh, again, just start to think of this certainly here for the, the next few years as something uh, of an ongoing process that we should uh, continue to, um, you know, pay time and attention to. Um, again, our options with us, again, you know, we certainly would welcome the opportunity to take you through quick analytics. If you are a subscriber, you already have access to it. Uh, we'll walk you through your credit stress test. Um, certainly, we'd encourage you to schedule a demo with David and his team at IntelliCredit, uh, where you can see not only how um, stress testing can be, you know, deployed through a through a, a loan review, but also, um, you know, the the tools that we have, and then we'll be enhancing uh, in the spring uh, with the portfolio uh, analyzer. So, a lot of ways we were we're we're here to help. Uh, would love to have conversations um, with you. Um, again, just uh, familiarity on what we do with quick analytics. I won't uh, move through those. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with IntelliCredit, uh, again, as David mentioned, we do have an external loan party or excuse me, loan review service. Um, but then on the application side, uh, we have a solution which allows you to uh, analyze your portfolio, obviously do annual reviews and internal reviews. So a lot to, to unpack there. Uh, again, uh, we start with your ILDR file. Um, but again, I encourage you to, to learn uh, more uh, about that. Uh, a couple of things, uh, as we, uh, and, and while we're uh, talking about these, certainly any questions you have, please submit those in the chat or the Q&A feature. Uh, we do have some upcoming events. Uh, well, in December, we'll have our final Cecil Coffee Talk uh, of the year. David's going to join Steve and I on that one. Um, but also in December, we are going to do kind of a quick analytics coffee talk where we just, uh, you know, again, kind of refresh some of the tools such as the credit stress test um, that are available to uh, to you in the tool. Um, but again, give you the opportunity to ask questions about maybe different functionality that you may, may or may not be familiar with or have questions about. Uh, again, we want you to be able to utilize these tools as effectively as possible. So we're gonna do a webinar, uh, a coffee talk on the 15th where we will entertain those questions and then touch on uh, a few of the more popular uh, features of in or excuse me of, of quick analytics. Um, in addition, uh, we have done a couple of recent webinars uh, discussing IntelliCredit. 
Uh, we've invited bankers who are actually using the tool. We feel like they will give you a better uh, explanation of how it benefits them. Uh, the first one we did was with Zane Smith, a chief credit officer at a bank in Texas. The most recent one was with Mitch Moss, uh, a senior VP and credit analyst at Outdoor Bank. Um, so I'd encourage you to watch those videos if you want to learn a little bit more about how the Portfolio Analyzer tool is assisting uh, community uh, banks. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and submit those. Steve and David, any final comments uh, before we let everybody go today? Thank you very much. Always a pleasure joining. And 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 I know we're in RFP season for loan review, and we we welcome uh, very much uh, anybody that would like to at least take a shot at uh, a, a proposal from uh, IntelliCredit on your loan review services for next year. And again, if you're doing it, uh, we designed IntelliCredit to be agnostic to whether you're using it as third party. So we've got a number of clients that have totally independent in-house loan review, don't rely on third parties that use the same tool. Great. Thank you, Steve. Any final comments? No, I just uh, I saw that I saw that custom quick analytics coffee mug on the screenshot on the last uh, slide, and I desperately want one of them. So I'll be waiting for that in my stocking, <laughs> Sean. Very good. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, we got in just under the hour, so we appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing and seeing seeing you in December at the the, the two coffee talks. And in the interim, if you have any questions, you know, go ahead and reach out to us uh, at 800-285-8626 or info at quickrate.com. And we will certainly uh, be back in touch with you and try to get either a demo scheduled or a question answered. So uh, on behalf of David and Steve, thanks again for your time. Uh, have a great day and have a, a happy Thanksgiving next week. Bye thanks, now. everybody. <clears throat>